Jeffrey Miller, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks, Brett. So your book is is Mate. Um, it's about the science of dating and mating and relating and all that jazz. You're you're an evolutionary psychologist that's written several books, published in, uh, in leading journals, but you ended up partnering partnering with uh, Tucker Max on this book. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners know him for his like I hope they serve, serve beer in hell. How did that partnership happen? I mean, granted, it sounds like a bizarre. Um, match at, at first glance. Um, but actually, Tucker's a really bright guy and knows a lot of the science already. What happened was I, I read an interview with Tucker um, by a friend of mine um, that had happened back in 2011. And Tucker clearly, um, he explicitly mentioned my first book, The Mating Mind, by name and said it had, had a big impact on him. He clearly knew a lot about evolutionary psychology, my field, and about sexual selection and animal behavior. And so I emailed him 2012, and uh, just kind of expressed my interest in, in you know, how, how is a, a leading popular author of, of fratire so knowledgeable about my field? And we started corresponding. We got together for dinner, actually, within two weeks in Austin, Texas, where Tucker lives. Um, hit it off, had a lot of common interests, and started kind of lamenting the, the current state of dating advice to young men. And that really dominated this first dinner conversation and, and was the seed that launched the whole Mate book. Yeah, and you guys started off uh, with a website uh, before the, the, the book, which is jam-packed with great information there. Yeah, we've been running this website called Mating Grounds for about the last uh, 15 months. And we have our own podcast series, which includes mostly answering questions from guys and giving the best evidence-based advice that we can. But also we've got interviews with experts. And we've also got a case study of, of a young guy that Tucker knows, Joe, where we've kind of been coaching him for 30 episodes through getting his life together and improving all his traits and proofs that are attractive to women and, and kind of improving his whole dating life. So there's a lot of content there. Yeah. And so you mentioned that there's, there's really not that much information out there about dating, or if there is information out there, it's, it's not that great. And that, which is sort of surprising because dating relationships, mating, like that's like a big part of life. Like right, what, what Freud said, like the, all there is in life is like work and love. Exactly. And, yeah. and it's sort of like personal finance, right? Like no one ever really sits you down and talk about money, even though like money's the thing that we all spend most of our time doing. So why is that? Why don't we spend more time on something that's so important or teaching um, skills or insights that are, that's something about so important in our life? That's a really good question. And, um, Tucker and I actually wrote thousands of words about this that didn't make it into the book just for reasons of space. So there's a whole backstory about why has modern culture failed young men so um, extremely and, and profoundly. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that anything to do with sex and dating and mating and marriage is, is very politically controversial and people have really different ideologies about it. So like a public high school can't really teach a course on how to do dating and mating effectively because it would be seen as as biased or partisan or sort of inappropriate. Um, also, parents feel like they just don't understand the current mating situation. The technology of mating is moving so fast, like texting and online dating and the way that dates happen. So grandparents and parents don't feel like their expertise is that relevant to young people even though a lot of it actually is because human nature doesn't change that much. And then there's, you know, people seeking to make a bunch of money off of insecure young men, um, basically scammers and slightly sociopathic pickup artists trying to sell their, their weekend programs. Not all of them are bad. Some of them have good insights. But, um, you know, the economic model that they have is – is very different from what we're doing in Mate. We're just like, we're going to stick it all in one book. It's fairly cheap. Boom, that's what we know. Other folks are more like, how can we make thousands of dollars out of young men's insecurity before we give away useful information? Yeah. I mean, was there a time in our, our culture when you know, we passed on this information about successful courtship and successful mating? I think there have been cultures that had more effective initiation rites where once you hit puberty, if you're a young boy or girl, 
the elders will kind of take you off into the bush and, and teach you stuff. And normally that stuff was considered sacred and secret. A lot of it had to do, you know, with kind of hunting and gathering, not necessarily with mating. But a lot of it was sexual wisdom. We don't really know mostly what was taught in, in those contexts. But at least uh, the elders of the tribe made an effort. And they did have these ritualized uh, settings and events that, that tried to teach young men what, what they needed to know. Gotcha. So let's get into some of the meat of your book about uh, research back tips that what men can do to improve their, 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 their dating life, their, their love life. Uh, so you start off talking about confidence, which I thought was really interesting because a lot of uh, success in dating is is based on confidence. Or I mean, I guess you could say a lot of success in life is based on confidence. But how do you build confidence for dating? Is it something that, well, if you get confident in one area of your life, it carries over to dating? Or is confidence domain specific? Yeah, we put a chapter on confidence right at the beginning of the book because it was the number one question that guys called in with to the podcast, they wanted to know, number one, how do I get more confident? Number two, conversation, how do I talk to women? I think you can build your confidence. A lot of it is based on demonstrated performance. I mean, there's a few tricks, there's a few life hacks you can use to kind of boost your confidence temporarily in a particular domain. But in the mate book, we're really about what are the sustainable long-term ways that you can increase your your confidence, particularly around women. And basically, that means you have to go out and have experience and interactions and build up the traits that you know will be attractive to women. It's very hard to feel confident if you don't understand what women really want and if you know you haven't cultivated the traits that they really want. Because then you get this imposter syndrome where you feel like, okay, maybe I can talk a good line, maybe I've got a good approach, but, but it feels like a house of cards. So I think you have to do some deep inner work and get the rest of your life together before you can really approach a woman with confidence. And, and most of the mate book is really about um, doing all that work sort of ahead of time, even before a date. It's not that hard, but it's something a lot of guys neglect to do. Yeah, and you, you talk about... Um you know, like what women find attractive, like what your second chapter is about, you need to understand what women, what it's like to be a woman, to have successful, uh, successful love life. So, I mean, what is it that men need to understand about women that they might not understand about women? Yeah. Another really common theme in, in the questions we got for the Mating Grounds podcast was guys would call in with a question that could be easily answered if they just taken a few minutes to kind of put themselves in women's shoes and ask, what, what is it like to be a woman? Why is she reacting this way? And we go step by step through the things about female life and experience that a lot, a lot of young guys don't understand. So, for example, what are women's fears, concerns, and anxieties? Women have a lot more fear about their physical safety, their sexual safety, like fear of sexual harassment and rape. Most guys don't get that. Um, Women fear about their sexual reputation. They're very worried about slut shaming, even today. And so they don't want to put themselves in situations where their sexual reputation is vulnerable to being, you know, mocked or, or belittled or criticized by their female friends. Um, so women are very safety conscious. And a guy's number one task in approaching a woman or, or presenting himself on a first date is not necessarily to impress the woman, but simply to make her feel relaxed and safe in your presence. And that sort of goes counter to what a lot of the dating advice you see online, where it's you need to show dominance right away, right? Um, yeah. Make if, them feel safe. Exactly. If you read all the stuff about you got to be an alpha male and show dominance, dominance is great for intimidating other men, so you scare them away. But when you show dominance up front to a woman... And you don't really know how to use it in an attractive way. It codes as danger in a woman's brain. It activates her amygdala. You know, it, it provokes anxiety. The woman thinks, well, why is this guy acting belligerent and assertive and, and even hostile to me? I don't feel physically safe. I don't feel sexually safe. Um, there can be a little bit of an erotic thrill to that 
which is the basis of most romance novels. But if you don't know what you're doing with dominance, it can drive a lot of women away. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about what the research says about what women find attractive in, in men and what, they, what sort of traits they should be working on uh, to develop. Uh, so what are the traits that women find attractive in men from an evolutionary perspective? There's a lot of traits, but we kind of boil them down to, to just five, um, partly for the sake of simplicity and partly because these are the five that we know how to um, improve based on the current evidence. Physical health mental health, intelligence, willpower, and what we call the tender defender trait. And then there's another four things that are sort of what are your proofs that you have those five traits. Um, We think there's really good evidence that those five basic traits are attractive. Physical health plays out in terms of how your body looks, how you move, how healthy you seem, how much energy you have. And the big leverage points for improving physical health are basically get enough sleep, which most young guys don't do, and it really handicaps them, eat right, and by right we don't mean pay attention to the FDA nutrition guidelines, we basically mean um, eat paleo, and I can go into that if you want, and exercise, and know how to do exercise that's really efficient and effective. You don't need to do cardio for an hour or three times a week, there's much more efficient ways to, to do exercise. And then for the other four traits, we go through analogous interventions that you can do in life that are maximally efficient and effective and don't take that much time, but that really bring results. Well, do you, I mean, going back to like, you know, physical health, like, do you have to be super fit, like Brad Pitt, Fight Club, Six Pack Abs, or, I mean, what, what exactly, what's the, uh, the minimum required, required fitness? I think there's a perception out there that you have to be shredded in order to attract a, a woman. Yeah, shredded is actually bad. I mean, if you're below 10% body fat, that's actually not as healthy as having a little more fat in terms of how your immune system works, fighting off colds and, and infections and diseases and, and all of that. So it's, it's fine to have a little bit of fat. You don't need to be super bulked up and um, have massive muscles. Women like muscles and they, um, they appreciate them. But if, if you look at hunter-gatherer guys, the guys who are good at going out and hunting and killing game and dragging it back to camp, they do not look like bodybuilders. They look more like um, MMA fighters or Olympic decathlon guys or just guys who are generally in good shape from doing you know, a combination of some aerobic work and also some bodyweight exercises or kettlebells or stuff like that. So you don't have to be in perfect shape. Women just don't want to be sexually repulsed by your body, basically. And there's a lot of young guys who are sexually repulsive in terms of what they look like. They're not taking care of themselves. And it's sad. So and I thought it was interesting that you mentioned willpower. We've written about that on the site, but I didn't think that it was something as a, a, a trait, a sexual trait that women would find attractive. What is it about willpower that makes uh, a man attractive to a woman? Yeah, willpower is closely related to a a personality trait called conscientiousness, which has been really well studied. Um, And it's basically your ability to take charge of your life, have some priorities, exercise self-restraint, avoid temptations, pursue long-term goals, and develop a kind of set of habits and a a regime of of self-improvement that requires some effort, but that demonstrates to women that you have ambition and that you care about making yourself the best guy that you can. So women read even basic cues like, do you have a decent haircut? You know, do you shave? Or if you have a beard, do you take care of it? Um, do you dress well? These are all signals of willpower at a certain level. So you don't think, well, willpower requires that I work 60 hours a week. No, it can just be ordinary uh, life habits to demonstrate you're making an effort. Yeah. And some women probably wouldn't want to be married to a guy who works 60 hours a week, right? Yeah. You can go too far in the conscientiousness direction, which shades over into, um, obsessive compulsive disorder or, or workaholism or other kinds of kind of behavioral addictions that, that are real turnoffs to women. Yeah. And so I love this thing also that you have this, this tender defender, because I think it, uh, it's a nice, uh, it's an, an alternative to like the, the alpha male dominance, you know, uh, theory that's put out there on the website. Can you explain what the tender defender trait is? 
Yeah, a tender defender is the way that we talk about striking the right balance between agreeableness and warmth and, and love and tenderness towards a woman and towards her friends and potential future kids you could have with them where you're really taking care of them and you show you have those those good boyfriend and good dad traits. But the defender is if there's an external threat, a challenge, a predator, a natural disaster, a criminal, um, or, or a more abstract threat, a social or financial threat, that you can rise to the occasion and deal with it, take care of it, and protect the woman and her kids. And women instinctively tune into who's going to be a good tender defender and have the right mix of traits. Women are turned off by psychopaths on the one hand because they're not tender enough, but they're turned off by the wimpy Mr. Nice Guys because they're not good at being good defenders. Gotcha. And I, th I think I've, I've read research where uh, women are attracted to dominance, but only whenever that dominance is uh, displayed to, I guess, quotation marks, enemies, people that aren't part of the tribe, so to speak. Yeah. A, a, you know, a girlfriend doesn't want you to show dominance to her mom, right, or her nieces or nephews or her her female friend, she wants you to show... Dominance is there for male versus male competition, gotcha. right? So if there's a threat from another male who's sexually harassing your girlfriend, she wants you to stand up and be dominant and get, get that guy out of her life. Um, dominance can also be very useful in bed during sex, right? A lot of women want guys to take charge in bed. But the rest of the time, if there's not an immediate threat... And if you're not actually doing foreplay or sex, then dominance is just kind of a pain in the ass and it's not even relevant to a woman's interests. Gotcha. So you mentioned signaling. Uh, what is signaling theory uh, in a nutshell? Signaling theory is the idea that animals, including humans, are motivated to display attractive traits to other animals, including mates, but also to rivals to intimidate them or towards predators to say, you can't catch me, don't even bother trying. And the key thing in, in the biology of signals is the signal has to be credible and reliable and hard to fake in order for the other animal or the other human to pay any attention to it. So if you go around sending signals that are easy to fake, no matter how good you are at doing something, then the other animal has no incentive to pay any attention to that. It's, it's called cheap talk. It's not a reliable signal. So in the mating domain with humans, what you want is to display all these attractive traits in a way that a less attractive guy couldn't do. That's a reliable signal. And that leads us from the traits that are attractive into these what we call proofs, social proof, material proof, aesthetic proof. Um, these are ways of, of signaling that I've got these attractive traits uh, in a reliable and unfakeable manner. Gotcha. Well, let's talk about uh, material proof because on the web you, you often read about uh, you know hypergamy, right? That mm -hmm. women are only attracted to guys who have lots of money. Is that true? It's true for some women, no doubt. I mean, some women are <laughs> are gold diggers and they're financially ambitious, and and that's fine. That's a valid life decision as long as they're upfront about it. Um, but the thing to remember about what we call material proof is that money didn't really exist until the last few thousand years. So during the whole course of prehistory when women were evolving their mate preferences and what they, they find attractive in men, um, there wasn't money, there weren't bank accounts, there, there weren't regular paychecks. So the women would pay attention to things like who's a good hunter, um, who's got high status and prestige in my clan or my tribe. But you couldn't stockpile resources. Even the best hunters would sometimes come home empty-handed and, and have to kind of beg vegetables from their girlfriends. So the idea that women evolved this, this fetish for wealth just can't be accurate in terms of the anthropology. Um, instead, we think wealth is really attractive to women mostly because it indicates deeper underlying traits that tend to lead to wealth in modern societies. Things like intelligence and willpower, social skills, you know, passion, dedication, ambition, all of that stuff. 
So I think when women see a financially attractive guy, most of them find that interesting because they know he had to do a whole bunch of stuff to succeed in his career, whatever it was. And it's the ability to do all that stuff rather than the money itself that's, that's primarily attractive. But if so, if you're in the position like you're a broke college student, it's not that you don't have money that women are. It, it's you should develop the traits that women will find attractive and say, well, he has the, I don't know, the capability of acquiring resources in a, in a future date. Yeah, I mean, for 25 years in, in evolutionary psychology, we know that young men actually value your your kind of future earning potential more than your current, you know, wealth level. So women are very good at projecting into the future, what is this guy's likely path? Is he doing well in organic chemistry and he's, he's pre-med and he's going to become a doctor at a, at a high likelihood? Or is he a sophomore who's got no idea what he's going to do, no major, no ambition, bad grades? Even if he's cute and charming, they'll kind of project forward financially and go, he doesn't have all the traits that are that are going to be required to succeed in, you know, modern America. Yeah, if if, if having money was like a, a rec- you know, something required to get married, like I would not have been, I got married when I was 22. Um, yeah. And so like I had piles of debt, um, but, you know, my wife still found me attractive for some reason. I, I'm guessing she saw the, my pluck that I, I might have had. Yeah, and the sad thing is most guys spend so much more time and energy chasing the money rather than educating themselves about how to become a more attractive guy. And that is such a, a roundabout and indirect way to achieve your mating goals. Gotcha. Let's talk about another social uh, a s- social proof. And one of those is just like, it's sociability, right? That you have lots of friends. Why is, why is displaying or signaling that you have friends or a, a large social network attractive to women? Showing that you've got a lot of friends um, is a great form of social proof because it shows you've got the social intelligence and the emotional intelligence to sustain long-term relationships. A lot of the same traits and skills that it takes for a guy to keep his male friends around are going to be relevant to entertaining and pleasing a girlfriend. It doesn't really matter which sex your relationships are. Those, those skills transfer. Also bear in mind that back in prehistory, Women often transferred from their home tribe where they grew up to another tribe where some attractive guy was who they wanted to have a relationship with. Now, if there's a lone guy just out in the forest with no friends, no clan, no woman's going to leave a safe home tribe to go out with that solo guy. They're going to be, you know, tiger meat pretty soon. They're not, that's not a sustainable situation. A guy's got to be surrounded by friends and relatives for a woman to feel um, safe at a, at a fundamental level. So if you don't have that social proof, it's really important to get it. So get out there, try, try to make friends, join clubs, things like that. Yeah. Um, meetup groups happen in every city in America. Um, a lot of guys lose touch with friends from high school and college. They don't need to. There's a video Skype. Um, and guys don't invest the effort in in their friendships. They get really lazy about it. And that's stupid because friends can provide an enormous amount of um, vicarious attractiveness. They can vouch for you. They can reveal to a, a woman things about you that you wouldn't feel comfortable bragging about yourself. So they can kind of do a lot of the courtship on your behalf. And what I thought was interesting throughout this book was, yes, it's about... Um, you do these things so you can attract women, but in the process, like you're becoming a better person. Like even if you don't get a date right away, like your your happiness will probably increase significantly if you just do some of these things that you guys lay out in your book. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, at one level, the book is you know framed and sold as dating advice, but Tucker and I also had a kind of um, covert mission, almost a Trojan horse, that we just wanted young guys to get their lives in general together better and we knew that sex was a huge motivator so if you just start lecturing guys about you need to get in shape they'll go yeah yeah yeah, someday if you go women will have sex with you if you get in shape then guys will go yeah okay i'll get in shape and then they get all the benefits of that and the rest of their social life their careers um 
We also know being in shape improves your mental health and your mood and your happiness level. So, yeah, there's a kind of um, hidden agenda that we want guys to, to create excellence in their lives more generally. And because they're so focused on mating, that's a kind of um, uh, a, a path forward that, that can tap into that motivation pretty, pretty easily. It's pretty sneaky of you guys there. Yeah. Uh, um, so one thing you mentioned in your book too um, was this idea of a sort of mating. How mm-hmm. does understanding a sort of mating help men in the dating world? A sort of mating is just the concept that, that like attracts like, that men with a certain set of traits tend to attract women who have similar traits. Um, the idea that opposites attract is complete nonsense. We've had 50 years of research in psychology showing that hardly ever works. I mean, men tend to attract women, but beyond that, people tend to pair up based on their overall mate value, overall how attractive are they. And this isn't just like the 0 to 10 scale of physical attractiveness. This is, are they physically attractive, socially attractive, intelligent, socially successful? Add up all of that, that's your mate value. And people tend to assortatively mate for overall mate value. But also at a more micro level, people tend to match on specific traits. Like um, married couples correlate pretty highly for IQ, general intelligence. They correlate very strongly for political and religious values. They correlate pretty strongly for personality traits. Um, And a lot of online dating sites like OkCupid with their match percentage kind of recognize this. You know, your match percentage is basically saying, if you want to be happy, do a sort of mating. We've asked these thousands of questions you can answer on OkCupid specifically so you can do a sort of mating and, and that tends to lead to happier dates. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting because there's often, you know, there's sort of a trope online where, yeah, the, the women are only attracted to rich guys and you can be old and, you know, if you have lots of money, then you can attract a young, attractive woman. doesn't matter your looks. And then guys just go for looks and women. But whenever I, I'm out and about, like I'm at Target or I'm at mm-hmm. Panera Bread and I look around at the couples, like, like these people do look pretty much the same, right? Like kind of overweight people are sort of with the overweight people. Attractive people are with attractive people. Medium looking people are with medium looking people. It seems like everyone sort of knows where they stand, as you said, in the, the mate market. Yeah, absolutely. And then if you get to talking to those couples and one is conspicuously a lot smarter than the other, there's a kind of like jarring sensation like, wait, what? Uh, how are they together? And you kind of worry this, this isn't going to last because, you know, the intelligent one's going to get bored and frustrated and, and leave. Or if people are really mismatched on things like fundamental religious or political values and they're always arguing about you know Bernie and Trump and, and <laughs> Obama and and or whatever or uh, you know which religion should we raise our our kids in you know that's not going to last very long yeah so we've talked about what women uh, find attractive in men but in order to have a successful dating life like you need to think about the type of woman you want to date and relate with in order to have a successful dating life. So what should men look for in a woman depending on their dating goals? I mean, all guys are kind of instinctively pretty good at paying attention to a woman's physical attractiveness. And that tends to drive a lot of decisions about, you know, who do you swipe right on on Tinder for? And, you know, who do you message on Match.com or whatever? Uh, We don't really need to worry about guys paying attention to that. So it's mostly about what are a woman's mental and moral and personality traits that are worth paying attention to? Um, if it's a short-term hookup, you know, one-night stand, casual sex, the main mental and moral traits to worry about are the kind of red flags that could create a lot of trouble. So if a woman shows con- conspicuous signs of personality disorders like borderline personality disorder or narcissism or or psychopathy those can be bad because you can end up in a situation of lies and deception and danger and stalking and recriminations and and disasters 
So it's important to learn about those traits. We talk about some of them in mate. Even if you plan to only spend three hours with a woman, she might not be planning to spend only three hours with you. Um, if there's any longer term relationship potential like girlfriend or even wife, then all of the same traits that women pay attention to in you should become relevant for you selecting women and for a lot of the same reasons. Um, you know, intelligence plays out in all kinds of ways that are hard to anticipate when you're young in terms of career success and money management and managing and re social relationships, resolving conflict, all of that stuff. So um, getting the brightest woman you can attract is important. Getting the most emotionally stable woman you can attract, the most agreeable and kind woman. Um, a lot of guys learn this stuff through bitter experience with girlfriends who don't have these desirable traits. And uh, in the mate book, we, we try to give guys a sort of preview of here's how things will play out if you don't pay attention to these, these traits other than just physical beauty. Yeah. I thought it was interesting, too, um, how, you know, there, I guess Bus has done those cross-cultural studies about what men and women find attractive. And I, people tend to focus on the differences, right? Men put a premium on physical attractiveness and women put a premium on uh, resources and wealth and things like that. But what they fail, what often these websites who report on this often f fail to report is that above those traits, right? Things like kindness, respect, like that's what both men and women put a premium on in, in a partner. Exactly. Yeah. That was one of the most striking things from that uh, bus study back in 1989, and it's been replicated in, in even more cultures since then, more than 50 cultures. You know, typically the top two most desired traits are intelligence and kindness. And then you often get things like um, exciting personality or a sense of humor or creativity or um, resourcefulness, adaptability. You know, all of that stuff. Um, in a crisis, would this person be a useful ally or a handicap? And no matter whether it's contemporary America or, you know, rural um, Uganda, those same traits can be super useful for both sexes. So you, you talk about something uh, that I've just re learned about recently, and you're hearing more about it. Uh, I think there's a book that just came out about this it's a uh, dating markets um can you explain dating markets and, and sort of the general gist of it and how they work and how they'll affect your dating life yeah mating markets is a a concept i got really excited about when i i spent four years in an economics department in london that did a lot of game theory and game theory is about strategic interactions between players like in a particular market um and it analyzes things like what's your bargaining power in terms of how many people desire things from you versus you desiring things from them. And in mating markets, that plays out very heavily in terms of what's the sex ratio, the proportion of women to men. But it also plays out in terms of things like what's the distribution of ages in the mating market or the distribution of physical attractiveness or intelligence or what are the, the social norms and expectations about dating you know, if you're trying to date in Salt Lake City, Utah, where there's a bunch of Mormons seeking husbands and wives, that's really different from San Francisco, where there's a lot of polyamory and open relationships. So most guys don't really think about what mating market they're in and whether they should move to a better one, which is crazy because young guys are willing to move to college hundreds or thousands of miles away. They're willing to move for a job but they're not willing to move to a different mating market that might make it 10 times easier to find the women that they want. So what are some, where are some places where it's sort of, it's tough for a guy? Is, I'm guessing it's places like New York City where there are a lot more, I don't know, how would you say this, like uh, driven women who have high paying jobs. Uh, would that be a tough dating market? New York is actually awesome for men. Okay. Um, I spent eight months there in 2013, and it's, it's terrific because the ratio of college-educated women in Manhattan to college-educated men, um, it's about one and a half or some, some places even two to one. So the women are desperate, and there's a real shortage of good guys. 
by good guys, they don't mean Wall Street bankers. They just mean guys who can dress and talk <laughs> and <laughs> at least buy them a coffee. So the sex ratio in New York is hugely advantageous to guys. Um, the really bad mating market is actually San Jose, California, near Silicon Valley, where there's a lot more guys than women. And the women who are there are in huge demand, and they have their pick of entrepreneurs and tech millionaires, and and a lot of the guys end up just becoming workaholics because they, they, that's all there is to do. They can't find a woman. All right, so when there's more men... Uh, women can get pickier. Yeah. When there's more women, men can get pickier. And this also applies to colleges. I mean, any college you're thinking about applying to, if you're a high school guy, go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia lists sex ratio for almost every university in America. And have a look. If that sex ratio is less than 60% women, you're going to have trouble. Um, if you want a higher sex ratio, Sarah Lawrence College is 70% women, 30% men. And the guys who have the good sense to realize that, oh, Sarah Lawrence College accepts men now, has done for 20 years. Um, women fall all over them, and it's really easy. Yeah. But here's the question I have. So I can see that being great, right? Like you go to a place where it's flush with women. You don't really – they'll be falling all over themselves for you. But I feel like from a uh, – man's perspective, say you want to settle down, right? Mm -hmm. Having that many choices could, I could see it causing like you to try to maximize like to the utmost, to the point where you don't even make a choice because you're like always putting off, well, maybe there's someone better out there. Yeah. This is something that does happen to highly attractive guys on Tinder in, in Manhattan is, is they're so spoiled for choice that, um, they, they treat women really badly and they know I can always find somebody for a, for a hookup tomorrow. And so they never develop a long-term relationship. And, um, that can bring its own emotional and social problems. But for most guys in most mating markets, um, if you're, if you're overwhelmed and spoiled with the amount of casual sex you're having, uh, you will eventually get tired of that and you probably will want to a longer-term girlfriend. This is something we realized in the Mating Grounds podcasts. Most young men don't just want a bunch of casual sex. They want a girlfriend. Um, and even if you're in a mating market where you could have a lot of casual sex, you can always opt to sort of um, make it last longer and, and you know, settle down with with a good woman. As you point out, the key thing is don't keep second guessing yourself and going, oh, I could find another woman who's like 3% prettier <laughs> and 2% higher IQ. Um, your life satisfaction in the relationship is mostly going to be at that point how you manage the relationship and not, you know, are you actually maximizing the every single trait that the woman has? Yeah. So let's, let's get it. We've talked about, you know, you're selecting someone. Um, let's get to the dating part. Is it still really up to the guy? I mean, what does the research say? Is it still up to the guy to make the first move when it comes to dating? Yeah, it really is. Um, it's up to the guy to make the first move and ask the woman out, and it's also up to the guy to pay for it. Um, the research on both of those is very clear. Now, women will give signals of interest, most of which are too subtle and young guys <laughs> don't pick up on and ignore. So the woman can often feel like she's the one making the first move. But really, it's up to the guy, um, either when he's approaching a woman in real life or when they're messaging through an online dating app. It's up to the guy to step up and go, okay, I'd like to meet you. You know, Here's my suggestion about where and when. Is that okay with you? And the woman will either go, yep, great, looking forward to it. Or she'll suggest an alternative or she'll say, nope. <laughs> don't want to meet. And then you know where you stand. Yeah. And, and, but how do you, how, I'm sure you guys get this question a lot too on the podcast, but how do, how should guys handle rejection? Cause I know for a lot of guys being rejected by women is really, really hard and it causes a lot of like anguish and anger. Uh, what can they do to just, I don't know, handle that better? I think there's, there's two things to do to kind of step back from the focus on 
am I getting the date? Am I getting sex? Step back from that and go, am I learning how to interact with women? And if you have that learning mindset that, hey, we've talked or we've messaged and I've been practicing my conversational skills or my, my verbal fluency, I've been practicing my storytelling and my sense of humor, then even if a woman says, no, I don't want to meet, I don't want to date, it's still a win because you're still getting experience and courtship. And if you go in with the mindset that I want to improve my skills rather than I absolutely must have sex with this woman, then you don't have to take the rejection that hard. Um, and secondly, you know, in terms of rejection, framing it as a matter of fit rather than quality. Most women reject guys not because the guy is fundamentally inadequate and could never attract any woman. It's just that particular woman, given her mate choice criteria, her preferences, what she's looking for, what her mating goals are, they don't align with yours. And, and that's okay. You don't have to take it as a rejection of your whole being. It's just we don't happen to fit. It's like going for a job interview you know, and the company or you realizing we're not a good fit in terms of employer-employee. Good. I like that. I like that analogy. So I'm curious, uh, Jeffrey, if cause I'm, I'm married, I've been married for 10 years, and I know a lot of guys who are listening are married too. Can some of these principles help married men in their long-term relationship with their wife? Absolutely. I think a huge mistake that a lot of husbands make is thinking that, well, courtship and attracting my wife is something I did before marriage. And now we're in some safe zone where I don't have to make any mating effort anymore. That's not how wives think about it. Um, wives expect continued mating effort and continued courtship and conversation and affection and attention throughout a marriage. And also the same traits that attract women to men initially keep women interested in men sexually and emotionally within a marriage. So I think even married guys will get a lot of, out of the mate book in terms of realizing, oh man, I've been neglecting like three out of the five fundamental traits that my wife wanted me to keep cultivating. Or I've been neglecting my male friends, or I've been neglecting my aesthetic proof, which is how I dress and how you know, we keep our home together. Or I've been neglecting my romantic proof, which is how much attention I pay to my wife in terms of investing specifically in her and our relationship. So all the same lessons, I think, still apply in marriage because there's really no finish line in terms of human sexuality. Awesome. Well, Jeffrey, this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, where can people learn more about your work? Probably the best place to go is just uh, matinggrounds.com, the Mating Grounds website. Uh, it's got a whole lot of materials, all of my academic papers, all 1,700 references and suggested readings for the mate book, um, all 200 plus podcast episodes. Uh, and we're going to keep adding material to, uh, to Mating Grounds in the future as well. Awesome. Jeffrey Miller, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Take care, Brett. My guest today was Jeffrey Miller. He's the co-author of the book Mate, and uh, you can find that on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also, check out Jeffrey and Tucker's website, Mating Grounds. That's thematinggrounds.com. You got to put the TH in front of it. Full of just awesome free information about uh, the research that went into this book. So go check it out. Also, they have a podcast you can check out as well.